You will now see portions of the four lessons in the SPC Plus training system. Lesson 1 covers the basics of SPC. The portion that follows explains the concept of assignable causes of variation and how these causes affect not only quality, but the operator's job. When your machine and only had to be concerned with these random causes of variation, there would be no problem. But other causes of variation can arise, which are beyond the normal part-to-part -part variation. For example, as the die becomes dull over time, the part dimensions begin to change. This is not a chance or random cause. This is an assignable cause. It is assignable because we can assign a cause for the change in the condition of the part dimension, in this case die wear, and we can do something about it. An assignable cause, such as die wear, would take the process out of statistical control. The purpose of SPC is to help you detect when an assignable cause occurs. Your experience on the press, coupled with the press pocket troubleshooter provided with this training package, will enable you to find the assignable cause and cure it before bad work pieces are produced. SPC provides you with a very accurate early warning system. It will tell you when the process is going out of control. In the past, the typical inspection process would catch defects after they occurred. Of course, once the parts were made, it was too late to do anything about it. SPC will help you to detect variations in the process that are not caused by normal random variations. In other words, you will know when the process is out of control or about to go out of control. This makes your job easier, since you'll know when you need to take action to find and correct the problem and when to leave the process. Later in Lesson 1, the operator learns more about the information a control chart provides and how it will enable him to work smarter, not harder. To using a control chart is that you can quickly visualize what has happened to the process over a period of time without looking at the specific numbers involved. The control chart provides a visual representation of the press line over a period of time. There are three important lines drawn on this control chart. The middle line represents the average size of the measurements taken during the capability study. It represents the center of the bell-shaped curve. It is called the center line or average line. The other two lines are called the upper control limit and lower control limit. The mathematics of SPC proves that 99.73% of all the measurements made will fall between the upper and lower control limits when the process is in control. Therefore, when any value falls outside these limits, the odds are very good that the process is out of control. Does an out of control condition mean that you are producing out of tolerance parts? That will depend on the relationship between the tolerance limits for the dimension and the width of the distribution. But in any case, since the process is changing because of some assignable cause, you will eventually begin to produce bad work pieces. It is better to look for the cause now and correct the problem than produce unacceptable parts. Why is it better to use SPC to control a process than the measuring methods that were used in the past? Suppose an operator measured just one part and found its size was close to the tolerance limit. He might decide to adjust the shot height so the parts would be closer to the nominal dimension. Yet that single part measurement does not indicate where the process is actually centered. Suppose the part that the operator measured was actually located at the left side of the bell curve for the process. He would have made an adjustment he didn't need to make since the parts were not going out of tolerance or out of control. What if the part he measured happened to be at the other end of the bell-shaped curve? Adjusting the machine by the same amount would not solve the problem. He would still be producing a large percentage of parts out of tolerance. Even worse, what if the process was still centered in the same location, but the range of the process had widened? If the part he measured was at this end of the curve and he made the same amount of adjustment, 
he would have created out-of-tolerance parts. He would have caused the very problem he was trying to prevent without knowing it. Lesson 2 explains what an X-bar chart and an R-chart are measuring and how to calculate and plot the values. The following section explains the importance of understanding and viewing both charts. Groups are to be taken every 30 minutes. A second subgroup of parts is measured a half hour later and the values averaged. In our example, the value is 12 and a half thousandths. The chart is marked at the point where the number two line on the timeline intersects the 12.5 line on the vertical scale line. The two points are then connected together with a straight line. This process is continued all during the production run. The R chart is a range chart. It shows you how wide a range of sizes is occurring within each subgroup. For example, if the largest measurement in a subgroup is five thousandths and the smallest measurement is three thousandths, the R value for that subgroup would be two thousandths. As you can see, you find an R value for a subgroup by subtracting the smallest value from the largest value within the subgroup. Since the R value can't be less than zero, the lowest value on the R chart vertical scale line is usually zero. The horizontal scale line is divided into numbers for each subgroup measured. The range values are plotted on the R chart just as the average values are plotted on the X bar chart. If the R values increase, the width of the normal distribution curve will widen at the base. Now you can see why both charts are needed. It is possible for the average size to remain the same while the range can be out of control. The opposite is also true. The range may be in control while the average size may shift and be out of control. Later in lesson two, the operator will learn how to calculate values when a balanced dial indicator or digital gauge is used to provide the data. The section that follows discusses what to do when the dial is set to the nominal dimension and both plus and minus values occur in a subgroup. The dial indicator or digital display reads the actual size of the dimension. The methods for finding the X bar and R value are the same as you learned earlier. However, some gauges called balanced dial gauges are set so that the nominal dimension for the feature is displayed as zero on the gauge. In this way, the gauge shows you how much each part is above or below the nominal dimension. For example, here is a balanced dial indicator reading the dimension on this feature of a part. If the dimension were exactly to the print nominal dimension, the gauge would read zero. If the dimension were ten thousands over the nominal, it would read plus ten. If the size of the next part were twenty thousands under the nominal, it would read a minus 20. If you are working with balance gauges of this type, you must use some different rules to calculate the average of the dimensions you will plot for a subgroup. Here is a subgroup that includes five values. They are plus five, minus three, plus two, minus six, and minus four. The plus or minus is the sign of the number. The fact that these are signed numbers changes the calculations that must be performed. Let's look at how signed numbers work. Here is a scale similar to a thermometer with each of the values found in the subgroup marked. If you were to use your normal method of calculating this subgroup by just ignoring their sign, you would get a total of 20. If you divided 20 by 5, the answer would be 4. If you look at the thermometer, you can see that a value of 4 is not likely to be the correct average for this subgroup. By looking at the spread of the values, you might estimate that the average should be around minus 1. To find the correct value for subgroups made up of signed numbers, begin by grouping all the numbers of the same sign together. Now add the numbers together. Be sure to place the sign of the numbers you added in your answer. In this case, you would have a plus 7 and a minus 13.